So I'm going to have a little chat with you tonight about uh, managing your microservices, bringing order to chaos. So let's start with the obligatory who the hell am I and why am I up here talking. I'm Sussex born, I'm a Sussex Uni grad. In fact, two of my lecturers are in the room tonight, not awkward at all. Um, <laughs> I've been doing web development since primary school. I say web development, hacking away with HTML and JavaScript. I've been doing it properly for the last eight years, of which five of those have been with Brownwatch, actually getting paid for it. I chose to specialize in Java and Spring backend systems, and in particular specialized in data storage and retrieval, which led me down this path of microservices and all the hell they entail, or do they? So a little bit about this building and a little bit about the company. It was founded in 2008, and we're a social media monitoring platform. 300 plus employees, it's now six offices. We've had Singapore open since I made this slide. Uh, four countries. Uh, we have three distinct products now. We're one of the few companies that have the Twitter firehose, so that's all of the Twitter data. We crawl nine million websites per day, so Brownwatch is all about huge volumes of data and about huge amounts of processing, and the microservices model fits really nicely with that. So, what I'm gonna cover today is less about specific tools and specific processes, and more about the building blocks you can use to solve the problem of mi microservices and how they scale. When you start to get into the regions of having hundreds of little tiny microservices everywhere, how do you not go nuts trying to keep all of that together and knowing what's deployed where and what's talking to what? So to help go through this, and the reason I gave you a little bit of background about the company is I'm gonna start with a real world problem, which is the latest product we've been developing. I'm gonna explain a little bit about the background of that and how we broke it down and how we developed the operational approach we've come to now. So if you're all sitting comfortably, I shall begin. So product's latest brainwave. Someone came to the engineering department and said, hey, we've got a great idea. We're going to build this new product, which is our, a product we called Audiences. And the idea is it's influencer discovery. I want to know who are the most influential female developers in the south of England. And the system goes off, uses various proprietary metrics to work out who are the most influential people with that demographic that you've just defined. They wanted it to be real time. This has driven a lot of our architecture. This thing had to be instant. There's competitors' products out there, but you wait days, hours for these reports to come back. We wanted it to be instant. You didn't need to set anything up. You could just whack in the search you wanted to make, and it would come back with the results. And from an engineering side, we wanted to make sure that this thing could scale. We wanted to go, we've got around about 3,800 customers of which most have over 100 users. That's a lot of people using our system at peak times. We wanted to make sure that when, I say when, this became the next big thing that it could scale up. And we wanted to make sure that it kept that low latency all the way through it. So, audiences. This, this was a really interesting one because it was a very rare greenfield project. It was a completely fresh start. Complete, we were given complete carte blanche, new tech stack, anything we wanted to. So we decided to sit down and have a good long think about how we were going to tackle these problems and what were the criteria for coming up with, with a solution. So number one, it needs to be scalable. It needs to be a system that could grow. The more users we had, it would need to be able to keep up. And I don't mean just throwing more CPUs and bigger boxes at it. This needs to be something that could infinitely scale. It needed to be repeatable. Whatever we did, we needed to make sure that if the whole of the United Kingdom burned down, we could do this again somewhere else fairly quickly, get back up and operational. And repeatable also makes things like development servers easier. If you can repeat it in your live system, you can repeat it anywhere, and that means you can make dev servers a lot easier, and you start to find that your development servers are closer to live, you get less bugs. Hands off, we wanted to make sure that the whole setup process, the whole management of this was as hands off as possible. We wanted to make sure that the devs spent as much of their time as possible actually developing software, not worrying about how it was all gonna run and fit together. It's got to be visible. It's got to be, you've got to be able to take a look at it and go, oh yeah, that's how it works. There's no point having something that's really clever, but if no one understands it, it's not going to get used, it's going to get broken, it's going to be difficult to maintain. Affordable. CEO loves it when I put bits in like this. It's got to be as cheap as possible to run within the constraints of these other points. So that is a consideration. I know, I know us developers like to forget about it sometimes and just do what's shiny, but cost does come into it every now and again. It's got to be rapid. We've got to be able to change this process quickly. We've got to be able to change the design quickly. And we've got to be able to change the way we build it quickly. So not just what we're building, but the way we build it both have to be 
rapidly changeable. Portable. This one was a lower priority, but we want to make sure whatever we do can be done anywhere, so we're not tied into a particular hardware manufacturer or a particular software platform. So we kind of came up with a very high-level solution to this, which is we wanted to split our apps into two distinct things. And that is the compute platform, which I'll talk about later, and the runtime platform. So we split the whole, the whole stack into these two distinct parts. And both of those parts have got to be independent, flexible, and meet these criteria that I moved on to the right there to make sure that, uh, that we can move as quickly as possible. So I'm going to start by talking about the compute platform. And what I mean by the compute platform is it's the server. It's the hardware. And by hardware, I mean, firstly, the physical chips and bits, your processors, your RAMs, your hard drives, et cetera. There's bits of this that other people don't think about when they think about bare metal servers in the data center. You've got to think about your networking, your connectivity. If you're running a server, you can't plug it into the ASDL line in your uh, office and expect it to scale to thousands of users. Network connectivity is really important. Upstream access, as well as having network access, you've got to make sure that you have the right kind of network access. You've got to make sure you're going to be able to access those level one and level two transport providers, so that you're getting a decent amount of throughput and you're getting connections to the right kind of systems at the right kind of price. You've got to think about your operating system. Your hardware is no good if you're not running any OS on it, and that's an important choice. Your support stack, you've got to think about physical hands in the data center. You've got to think about, do you have the support systems in place to maintain these, these systems? You've got to think about libraries. If you're running, if you're running a, an application, a lot of the time, particularly with things like Python, you're going to need to make sure your libraries are there and accessible. Even when you're not running high, uh, things like Python, you've got to make sure you've got the right version of the operating system, the right Unix tools. We've all had this situation where you've gone to run a command, it's not worked how you thought, and it turns out they've got the BSD versions of core utils instead of the GNU version of core utils, and they don't quite behave the same, and everything gets a little bit fussy. Now, when I say chips and bits up here as well, there's a lot of hidden things in that that people don't think about. You're thinking about cooling, security, redundancy, physical space, safety systems like fire, fire monitoring. There's a lot that goes into physical hardware. So let's think about that as one problem. Let's think about that on the side. And we came up with two solutions to tackle these problems. For the physical chips, networking, and upstream, we decided to go with AWS, let someone else deal with the problem. And we use a tool called Terraform to coordinate that. We'll get a little bit more onto Terraform later. For this part of it, the operating system, the support stack, and the libraries, we use Packer. So what is Packer? Packer is a declarative language for constructing virtual machine images. So Packer is all about, if, hands up who's used AWS? Awesome, Google Cloud Compute, Linode, cool. You've all, most of you have come across this. You have to start with an image. You, have to, you can't boot a virtual machine in these systems without having some kind of base image to start from. And Packer is all about making those base images. So it allows you to customize that so you don't have to you know, start with a raw Ubuntu image and pile a load of stuff on. You can pack it all into the base image. Supports lots of different platforms. It supports, as I said, Linode, Google Compute Platform, uh, AWS, Rackspace, uh, and a few others. You define both what you want to build and how you're going to build it. The way it works is it spins up a, a virtual machine in that environment, makes all the changes, and then snapshots it into the final uh, image form for you. So that's the how bit. When I say how to build it, that's like what kind of machine instance to use to actually do this build process. We then use Ansible to make the bulk of, bulk of our changes. Again, just because it's very readable, Ansible, you can declare exactly what you want, and at the end of it, it will, will be like that, hopefully. Uh, our base image is Ubuntu Cloud Server Edition, and on top of that, we, we put a fairly minimal amount of stuff into our operating system into our, into our compute platform. And I'll get onto the reason for that later on. But all we have is Docker, Python, some AWS optimizations. We have a few scripts around mapping volumes in AWS to make life easier for us, and some speed optimizations in the kernel and stuff just to make sure it's really running as quick as it can. And a couple of custom cloud init scripts to do with copying SSH keys in so we can actually get into the machine. So that's what Packer does. And let's have a little look at a Packer script. So it's YAML. Is it? Yes. Yes. No. 
It's groovy. It's Jason. It is Jason. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so used to the latter part, which is all YAML. I just assume everything's in YAML. Uh, as you can see here, this is how we're going to build it. So this is, OK, our base uh, machine is going to be this type. And this is the, the root AMI, in this case, the Ubuntu image. And then these provisioners say, OK, these are the steps you're going to take to convert it into our custom AMI. And you see most of those are a couple of little shell scripts to install Ansible and run it. So that's the packer part of it. That's about getting a base image. The next part of this is Terraform. It's made by the same people who, who make Packer, HashiCorp. You've probably heard that name before. They make Console and Vagrant. They're one of these companies that's popped up and then suddenly become invaluable to companies everywhere with the tools they make. It's a declarative language for constructing virtual systems. What I mean by that is it's a way for you to say, I want five of these machines, 10 of these machines. I want them to have these firewall rules. Do it. And then Terraform takes care of actually physically constructing those machines, wiring them together, and booting them all up for you. So that controls all of our AWS instances. Our, uh, it's not just EC2 that it controls. Um, it's also controlling any of Amazon's feature sets, so uh, Redshift databases, constructing those, Route 53 DNS entries, IAM security policies, all of that kind of stuff is dealt with within the Terraform configuration. And it's, it's diff-based, so if you make a change to it, so if you upgrade a machine from one instance type to another, it's not going to tear everything down and build it up again. It's just going to go ahead and make the smallest possible change to get you to the new state, which is really handy for doing upgrades. And it allows us to specify our infrastructure as code. So a lot of the time, you have data center computers. No one's quite sure how they're all put together. No one's quite sure, is this box still used? What's it used for? What kind of hardware has it got? We have a file. And from that file, we know exactly how our environment looks. And we know that that environment does match the definition we've got because Terraform makes it so. It provides very consistent and repeatable setup, coming back to those original points that I made. Because of Terraform, we can run this anywhere we need to. And we know that every time it finishes running, we're going to end up with an environment that's the same. I talked a little bit already about the diff-based updates, smallest possible changes. Anything that you can do in the AWS console, the web console, you can do via Terraform, give or take. There are a few sub-options that aren't supported, but most of the time you can get what you need to do done. So this is a Terraform script. This is for our development rancher instance. And you see here you, you have a resource, and you say what that resource is. In this case, it's a, an EC2 instance, and this is the name of that instance. And it has a whole load of properties you can set. And there are hundreds per resource. You just set the ones you need to. This, the defaults are always really sensible. So in this case, I'm saying I want an M4 large instance. The AMI is my predefined image. We've got some variables hidden away in another script. I want one of them. It's going to be Mr. Phil's key. This is the IAM profile I want to associate with that instance. That's our security profile. It says what other Amazon instances and resources it can access. We can put some tags on it that we use a little bit later on. We give it some hard drives, in this case, EBS instances. We give it its security groups, its subnet, its VPS, its cloud init script, all that kind of stuff. And it just goes boom, done. And it makes that instance for us. You see, you've got references here. So this security group that I'm assigning it to is defined in another part of the Terraform script. And I can just reference it by, by these little uh, substitution strings here. And one nice thing about Rancher, it's really good about resolving these. So if you've got a reference, it'll make sure that's built before it tries to execute this so you don't get into any horrible dependency loops. So what do we use in AWS? We use quite a lot of it. We've, we've kind of really bought into this. So we use the VPCs, which is like having your own private data center within Amazon. Uh, now, this goes a little bit against what I said earlier about vendor lock-in. We decided to trade off some of that flexibility for the speed and ease that some of Amazon's tools give us. That is a decision that every company has to make. How far along that road you want to go, how far out you want to go. Um, we use all of these technologies here. Lambda, in particular, is a really interesting piece of tech if you can coordinate it, because it's serverless code. You write a piece of code, and it just runs somewhere in Amazon. It's not even on an instance. It's just somewhere out there. And they say you can write entire applications like this because you can map endpoints through to Lambda functions, and it's all fantastic. But you try managing thousands of these needed to give your ap average application, and it starts to become a little bit difficult. 
So we just use it for backups. We use it for triggering backups and doing certain automated actions within AWS. RDS is really nice. We've really bought into this in a big way. It's managed databases. You just go out to Amazon. I want a uh, MySQL database or Postgres database. I want it to be replicated to this many machines. Do it. And it constructs it, maintains it. You can even set it to upgrade versions automatically for you if you like to live dangerously. Um, so yeah, this, this goes a little bit against what I said earlier, but sometimes these trade-offs are necessary. So what I'm going to talk about next is the runtime platform. So we've got a hardware, we've got a very basic Docker machine, essentially, something that's built for running Docker images. I've already jumped the gun a little bit, and I've said that it runs Docker. But one of the things we did need to consider before we even got down the hardware route was what was our unit of deployment? And this is, this is something that's really overlooked a lot of the time when people are deciding to roll out systems. But the unit of deployment, the thing you're actually going to deploy, really informs a lot of your tool chain, it informs the kind of operating system you can use, and it, affor it informs your process quite heavily. So we had a little think about the kind of units we wanted to do. Did we want to do an Uberjar slash a WAR? Did we want to do Java 9 modules? Really live dangerously. Um, did we want to do tar archives, just zip everything up and SCP it across to the machines, which is the Facebook approach, except they use BitTorrent instead, uh, so it scales. Do we want to use virtual disk images? Do we want to use something like v VMDK, virtual machine disk images, and package everything up with its operating system as a nice ready-to-go hard drive image? Do we want to use Docker containers? Do we want to use Kubernetes pods? So we went through this list and we said no to Uber jars and was. They're very Java specific. That's really taking us down a vendor path. That's locking our entire ecosystem into Java. <coughs> Java 9 modules, they're experimental and they're Java specific. Tar archives, yeah, they're okay. Some of our, our existing applications do use tar archives to, to deliver it, mostly on the sort of Node.js side of things. They're great, but you need different build tools and different deployment tools to build those for every language you're doing. It's not very consistent. It's not great. It's a bit low level. Just no. No to disk images. Too heavy. Too much to push around. Kubernetes pods, again, vendor lock-in. We might reconsider this these days as it's starting to grow in popularity and more systems are sort of taking the Kubernetes way of doing things and integrating it into their own stacks and adding support for Kubernetes, including Rancher, which I'm going to be talking about later. We decided to go fairly raw. We went with Docker. Docker's lovely. Everyone loves Docker. Except they don't, because it doesn't solve all of your problems. People tout Docker saying, yeah, great, you've got this, this thing, you can just deploy it and it runs. But at the end of the day, much like these other things, you're still left with a whole load of uh, units that you need to move around, deploy, coordinate, get working happily together. So, you know, you're halfway to solving the problem, but you're not there yet. So why do we bother with this? So by abstracting our runtime platform from our compute platform, we've gained that flexibility. We've gained some reliability. It doesn't matter if a single machine fails, because your apps don't depend on machines. They could, they're they're self-contained units of deployment. You can move them around. You can do what you need to do with them. So they're very portable. You get a lot of control as well. You can say, right, my Docker image has all the libraries, all of the bits of the operating system that I need to run this app. You know, be it a Java app or a Python app, that it's going to have the right runtimes, the right libraries, everything you need to get going. What we don't get is any better way to manage the hundreds of services we're deploying. So this audience app that I kind of put all this in the context of is 40 microservices and growing. Every time we do something that, that you know, multiple parts of the app need, we make it into a service and we keep adding more. And you know, this isn't doing anything to solve that problem. Now we just have containers instead of jars causing us pain in the ass. So bring on the moo cows. This is the, uh, the rancher logo. And I have to say, I've really been converted to the ch church of Rancher. I've like fully bought into this. It is just one way of solving the problem. And it's one uh, of the tools to follow the, the sort of building blocks that I'm going to lay out in a second. But when we first started using it, we were seriously like, oh my god, this is incredible. This ticks so many boxes for us. We loved it. So hopefully, I can show you a little bit of why we loved it. What does Rancher provide? And I, I'm going to go through all of these in more detail. But it essentially provides you volume abstraction, coordination, point-in-time rollbacks, 
rolling upgrades, so machine at a time upgrades, monitoring, service discovery, load balancing, multiple segregated environments. So you can have one branch, for instance, controlling lots of your dev environment, your stage environment, your live environment, all from the same control system. It's got a really nice metadata API, so you can find out all about what's going on within your cluster. And it provides some really nice software-defined networking features, some networking features. It's, it's still not security focused, but it's more about ease of use, this whole uh, networking layer on it. So let's talk about these building blocks. Uh, these, these are the things you need to solve the problem of lots of microservices. So I'm going to talk about, first of all, let's talk a little bit about the rancher stack. What are the components of a rancher cluster? So you start off with an environment, which is the isolated effectively data centers within Rancher. They are the completely separate units of resource. Within an environment, you have a machine, and a machine is a physical host. It's a piece of hardware that can run Docker containers. Also at that top level, you have stacks, and stacks are sets of services. So a stack might be your web app, your backend database, your uh, website crawler and your favicon service. That's a stack. It's a group of things that all work together to provide your functionality to your users. A service is an individual component of that. It's a microservice. It's a part of that stack. And then a service has one or more containers, which are the physical Docker instances running within your hardware. So let's talk about defining your stack. An application has multiple services and dependencies and requirements. Rancher uses Docker to co Docker Compose, so the same syntax that's used by Docker Compose is, is used within Rancher. And that's used to define the information about which applications you need, how they talk to each other, what their dependencies are. There's also their own Rancher Compose file that's used to supplement this. This is to provide information like uh, scaling information, like I need five instances of this particular service. When we run Rancher, it ensures that all the dependencies are met, all the connections are made, and that everything is ready to go for that stack, and it's in a fully complete and running state. And it goes ahead and, and it coordinates spinning up the containers that you need. Uh, the Ranch Compose file that I talked about a moment ago, there's more functionality coming to that around resource scheduling and restricting certain containers, the amount of resource, the percentage of resource they can use in machines. So that's expanding. As I said, at the moment, it's just the scaling information provides a really nice CLI tool that you can execute against these composition files. And that, much like Terraform does, it just makes it so. It makes it happen. It goes off. It makes the changes necessary to get it to what you've defined. It also has this really nice catalog built in, which is loads of predefined stacks ready for you to run within your rancher environment. So they've got things like an Elasticsearch stack. They've got a Kafka stack. They've got a... Um, uh, whole GitLab stack in there ready to go. So, you, you know, once you've got Rancher in place, it's really easy to, to go off and get your whole dev environment, your whole production flow set up and ready. So this is what a uh, Rancher Compose file looks like. This is YAML. <laughs> this one I did get right. Uh, standard Docker Compose. I'm sure you, uh, if you've ever worked with Docker, who's worked with Docker? Cool. So a fair few of you in the room. You'll be familiar with this kind of syntax if you use Docker Compose. We specify the Docker image that we want to use, and we host our Docker images in Amazon's container repository. You can pass in string substitution for environment variables. So in this case, this one Compose file is used to, to run multiple branch servers in our development environment. Which ports you want to expose? There's some custom labels that help Rancher work out you know, where to put things and the stack name to run it on. Um, you can pass in custom labels that are available via the metadata API. This one's quite cool because this says this depends on another service and it'll make sure that that's up and ready to go. This external linking stuff tells it that I need to be able to access these servers. Go ahead and make sure that the networking is configured in such a way that I can access these. There's some, these are environment variables for the, for the uh, container. So it's really nice. Again, it's really readable. Much like Terraform, you can take a look at this and go, hey, I know, I know what our app's doing. I know what the components of our app are, and I know how they're all talking to each other. This is the Rancher Compose stuff. Like I said, it's literally just the scaling stuff at the moment. Cool. So 
let's talk about our first building block, which is the scheduling. I'm not talking about temporal scheduling or resource. I'm, I'm talking about resource scheduling in this case. So this is telling Rancher which kind of boxes that this container should run on or shouldn't run on. So you can give machines labels. So um, you can say, you know, this is a database type machine. This is a web type machine. This is a offline job type machine. And Rancher, when you spin up your stack, you can say in your compose file, like we did back here, we can say, you know, this is a, uh, this is a, this needs to run on a services type machine. And Rancher makes sure that when it spins up the containers, they're all on the right kind of machine. This fits really well with Facebook's machine class model. I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but Facebook only has like five kinds of server, five or six. They have like uh, a, a, a deep free storage server, a database server, a web server. So it fits nicely with that. It helps reduce the complexity of the number of types of instances you need to run under the hood. And it can be used to pin a service to a particular host for legacy reasons. If for some reason you do need to make sure that your database server still runs on DB1, you can pin that container to that machine to make sure it always fires up in the same place at the same time if you're not quite ready to buy into the whole portable microservices architecture. This is great. These, these blocks are, are not about telling you to start again from scratch. You have to do it this way. These blocks are tools to help you gradually move your infrastructure to gradually take pieces of it and they're all designed so you can implement little bits of them as you need to they'll fit nicely with legacy stacks so that's the first part scheduling our next building block is a really key one service discovery for microservices to be truly flexible and resilient you have to make sure that they don't care where they're running it should be that um, you can do the jeff bezos game days so in the early days of amazon he'd wander into the data center and pull cables out um, and your services have to be able to survive that. It has to be able to survive your machine dying and being moved somewhere else. So service discovery is a key part of that. And Rancher provides it using DNS. And the way it does that is you have this uh, special DNS format, which is your service name, your stack name, and a custom-defined suffix. So in our case, it's like .rancher. You can omit each bit of this if you're addressing the same area. So if you're somewhere that has the same suffix, you can leave the suffix out. We use, um, we configure our base OSs in our Docker containers to have DNS search domains so we don't have to put these in. If you're talking to an, a service in the same stack, you can omit the stack name as well. Ranch will just assume you're asking within the same stack. Uh, responses around Robin amongst all healthy instances, and I'll talk about healthy and unhealthy in a second. These update in real time. So the moment something dies and gets moved, it's going to get moved in the DNS entries immediately. There's no like polling of it. It will just go. It will no longer be a valid DNS response for that service. You can, in the Docker, in the Rancher catalog, there are catalog entries for exporting the internal DNS of Rancher out to external systems. So any bind nine compatible system, uh, Amazon Route 53, you can take this internal DNS structure and make it external, which is how you go about publishing your services to the web, or one of the ways you can. Uh, you can also define what are called external services. So if you have something that's not a Docker container, but you still want it to be addressable in this way, you can create an external service, which is just a DNS pointer to somewhere else. So if you had something already up and running in your data center, like db1.databases, you can put that in as an external service and it will become available in this internal DNS resolution, but go through somewhere else. That's also important because you can then use it as a service for load balancing later on. So we're going to talk about service linking. This is stuff I showed you earlier saying this service needs to be able to talk to this other service. It's an, it's an alternative within uh, Rancher to exposing ports. So normally in Docker, if you need the way most people do it when they need to talk to Docker services is they expose a port and then you have to manage the ports and you have to work out is this free on this machine and when you've got services moving around that's not very convenient because you don't know if it's going to move to port 80 services together and one of them is going to die. So it's an alternative to that and it supports multicast as well so machines that are linked to each other will be able to view each other's broadcast packets. The way it works is by setting up um, layer 2 tunnels between the containers and it manages that all dynamically. So when you define it in your compose file, that will just happen and it'll establish the uh, tunnels automatically between the containers. 
It forms a sort of primitive SDN. Like I said, it's not, it's not really for security, it's more for convenience. The host machines do still need full access to each other to be able to establish those tunnels and publish ports that they need to if you do go down that route. So that's another building block. Let's also talk about persistent volumes. This was a big problem in the early days of Docker, which is you, you could define volumes in Docker, but you'd have to remember where you'd map that volume on the hard drive. And again, that's not great when you've got containers moving around machines. So in version 1.8, Docker added the persistent volume drivers. And Rancher went ahead and built on this with Convoy, which is their own persistence driver for Docker, which supports multiple backends, ClusterFS, NFS, and Amazon's Elastic File System, which I'm really liking at the moment because it's effectively an infinitely large NFS drive, which is brilliant. Particularly great for this kind of thing where you, know, you, just, you just want it to work. So in our Rancher Compose file, we specify I need to be able to access this volume and they're named and pre-registered in Rancher. And Rancher goes, when the container spins up, it goes, oh, you need this, this particular volume. I'll go ahead and make sure that's mapped through to you. And it connects into the Docker daemon, and it maps the underlying NFS or GlusterFS share, and then inside the Docker container mounts it in the right directory. So everything in your, do your, your Docker container just sees a folder on the hard drive. It doesn't know anything about this. Rancher makes sure everything's wired up correctly and can actually talk to it. There are limitations in this, in that it's network-based, so there's going to be latency issues. You don't want to be using this for something that requires fast disk access. But for a lot of cases, this is a great option for you. And it solves some of those problems of persistence. You can, you can, things are now completely free to move around your cluster as they need to. Load balancing. Uh, so Rancher has a managed version of HA proxy built into it. And it works at the service level. So, you know, we, we talked about services. We said these are your microservices within your app. So instead of saying, I, you know, I need you to load balance between these IP addresses on these ports, you just say, I need you to load balance this service. And Rancher takes care of going, okay, I can see there's five containers for that service. I'll put them all into HA proxy for you and make sure that it's kept up to date if any of them die or move. It does some advanced layer seven stuff like path detection. So you can say if it's forward slash hello, go through to this service. If it's forward slash goodbye, go through to this service. It does, because it, it is HA proxy underneath the hood, you can use a complete, it will allow you to put custom blocks of HA proxy configuration in, which lets you do things like A-B testing by doing percentage traffic splits between two versions of a service or sticky versus non-sticky, whether you want a person to always be low balanced at the same instance or whether it's okay for them to jump between them. And it's treated like any other service within Rancher. You can address it with the uh, DNS load balancing. So you can have multiple instances of your load balancers and they will be load balanced by DNS. You have load balanced load balancers, which is great for high resilience. <laughs> they update immediately. So their configuration in HA proxy, no downtime, just reloads the configuration as soon as something changes. They handle SSL termination for you in a really nice way. So in the Rancher UI, you register your certificates. And when it comes time to do a load balance, you just go use this certificate and it takes care of all the configuration for you. Combine this with external DNS and linking, it gives you a nice entry point into the system. So taking your Rancher cluster, this is probably one of the few things you'd expose publicly. So it's all nicely safely managed for you. The metadata API, so when DNS-based things fail you and you need to get your hands dirty with service discovery, you have that option. So inside every container, a bit difficult to read with the color scheme there, but you've got this right rancher hyphen metadata virtual host name. And when you hit that, that's actually going through to the rancher hypervisor. And it allows you to ask questions like what stacks are running, what services are running, what containers are running, where are they, what ports are exposed, what labels do they have. So earlier you might have seen I defined a few custom labels like the branch name and the version number, the git commit number. This is how I'd access it in my application. I'd access it through the metadata API and get those labels back in. A kind of primitive way of doing configuration passing. You, yeah, and it's available either in plain text or JSON. So when it's in JSON mode, you get these big blobs of lots of different properties back. But if you put it in plain text mode, you can in address individual properties, which is great if you need to do shell scripts and stuff. So some of our startup scripts, they use the metadata API and they pull in a few variables through that. Health checks. I love this. This is the best stock photo of a doctor I could find. It's really nice. I hope I never get that look from my doctor ever in my life. 
Um, <laughs> so health checks form a, a really large part of the, um, the ecosystem within Rancher. They're not just for your, your system admins to be using. These are a real core part of what makes Rancher tick and glues everything together. So these health checks are either HTTP or socket based. Sockets are just looking for an ACK. They're just looking for a connection to a service. These are for low level stuff like, is my mail server running? Just check that it can connect on port 25. Done. Your apps have to expose them. These, these aren't something that, that Rancher can magic into your system. Your apps have to actively you know, publish something that Rancher can connect to. In terms of the HTTP ones, what it's looking for is a 200 status back from the endpoint. Anything other than 200, it considers unhealthy. So it, it fits very much with the Nagios model of, of health checks in terms of HTTP ones. Now these feed into the rest of the system. So for DNS, they determine whether the machine is going to be available for the DNS response of that service. When you're deploying services, so Rancher has uh, incremental deploys. So you can go, OK, I want to upgrade the Docker container for this service. And Rancher's going to go, OK, I'm going to do one of them. And I'm going to wait until it reports that it's healthy before I do the next one. So if you've completely messed up your build and you run it and the app doesn't come up, Rancher's going to go, it's unhealthy. I'm going to stop the rollout because you've got multiple low balanced instances of your containers. Your customers see no downtime. The process stops. Click a button and it rolls back to the previous version. No harm done. So it really adds to the safety. You get to a point where you stop fearing deploys. You can just do it. It's like, eh, if it's wrong, we can roll back. It feeds into the load balancers. So again, if an instance is unhealthy, it'll be taken out of the load balancing. And the it's available in the metadata API. It determines there's a property next to each host that says whether it's healthy or unhealthy. Let's have a quick look around. Enough chatting about Rancher. Let's take a look at it. So these are my environments that I've got in my current setup. Um, one interesting thing is I said a little bit uh, earlier in the talk about Kubernetes. So the orchestration layer, the thing that decides what to put where, there are several you can use now within Rancher. So there's their own cattle engine, which is what we use, which is really simple. It's really easy. It follows very much Rancher, uh, follows Docker Compose and a couple of little extra bits on top. It's quite easy to understand. It does support Kubernetes as the underlying deployment structure. So if you are already bought into that infrastructure and you want to get some of these other niceties like service discovery, load balancing, you can still stick with your Kubernetes pods. They also support Docker Swarm, which is Docker's own version of this, uh, which is fairly recent. This is what it looks like. These are the physical hosts in my infrastructure. You get a really nice readout of the memory, CPU, and disk space available, the operating system it's running, the Docker version that it's got. This talk was converted from one that I did internally, so these are a little bit out of date. So there's some old Docker versions in here. But you can see these are all the containers that are running on those machines. Uh, adding a host is really easy. You just run this command on it, and R Rancher itself runs within Docker. So as long as you've got Docker, you've got Rancher, including the, the, the servers, so the interface and everything runs within Docker. And to connect into Rancher and become part of this coordinated stack, you run this command, it fires up its, its agent within Docker, maps through the Docker socket so it can talk to the host's Docker daemon, and from there it can start firing up containers, moving them around, shutting them down, monitoring them. It's really easy to get going. It has if you don't want to go down the route of Terraform, if you're not quite at that, that phase, Rancher has stuff for firing up instances within its own interface. So if you're doing a little development cluster, you don't need to worry about doing all of this at once. You can just put Rancher on a machine and let Rancher take care of firing up new hosts when you need them. It's a nice way to get started. So this is what it looks like when, you, when I go into a machine. I can see all the containers that are running. I can see their CPU, disk usage, I can see their load, and I can see their network usage. It's a really nice at-a-glance at look at which one of your containers is hammering your host. When I click through to one of those containers, I get a little bit more of an expanded view. I can see a little bit of the history, and I can see a little bit more about the machine it's running on. And if we go through, this is, this is some of that labeling stuff I told you. All of the information that was in our Compose files available in the UI, so you don't have to switch between the two. You can see how it was constructed from within the UI, what kind of parameters it was given. So you've got this nice little action menu here. You can stop, start, delete, 
containers, and the really interesting ones are your shell and log options up here. If I give that a click, I'm immediately in a shell for that container. I can start digging around in that container. I can start working with it. I haven't got to SSH to the machine. I haven't got to remember passwords or keys. I can just go, oh, that container's misbehaving. Let's see what it's doing. And in you go. And the same with logs. So Rancher hooks into the Docker logging stuff. So if your app logs out to um, standard out, it ends up in Rancher, which is really nice. It really simplifies your logging. You can then also use things like Log Spout, which also hook into the Docker daemon and forward your logs somewhere else. So all of ours go through to Amazon CloudWatch. So all of these logs are available for 14 days afterwards as well, which is really nice. Again, it simplifies things. Your apps don't care how it's done. They just spew out their logs, and Ranch takes care of it. This is one of the load balancers. This is why I was talking about service-based load balancers. I just pick the target service and target port, and through it goes which is really nice, really easy to set up. And again, you've got the scaling and resilience that's easy to configure. And this scaling stuff, it works all across the app. So if you're in the UI and you see that one of your microservices is getting hammered, just go more. And it spins up another instance. And then you go, oh, it's still being hammered. More, 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 more. And it spins up lots more instances and takes care of spikes. You know, If you've got some big event coming up, you can just temporarily add some resources. And when it's done, take them away again. And that all happens dynamically. This is the health checking stuff I was talking about. You can see here I've defined a health check that just looks to be able to open a port 1194. First person to tell me what port 1194 is. No, I haven't got a clue either. <laughs> I think it might be Kafka. Not sure. Cool. OK, let's have a wee little recap. So we've defined our compute platform as code. And it makes it really easy to understand. It makes it repeatable. It makes it scalable, easy to maintain, and easy to move around. We're providing ourselves a really solid, flexible base to run our artifacts on top of. And for that, we used AWS, Packer, and Terraform. Now, talk about our runtime platform. This coordinates the actual infrastructure for us. It coordinates running all of our microservices together. We just define what we need and how they talk to each other, and Rancher takes care of the rest. So that we had our building blocks, we had our scheduling, our service discovery, linking, persistent volumes, load balancers, metadata APIs, and health checks. These building blocks, these aren't just things that are unique to Rancher or unique to this flow of using Rancher. The, these are the things you need to solve the problem of microservices that can move and microservices that can scale. So there are other ways to solve these problems. You've got things like console can do service discovery. There's as well as, I talked a little bit earlier about pers uh, volume persistence drivers for, run, uh, for Docker. Docker 1.8 also added network drivers that let you hook into the network abstraction in, Rancher, in um, Docker. And there are various drivers for doing linking in that. So you don't have to use Rancher, but we found it's a nice all-in-one solution to these problems. And all of these things work together to help make our applications portable and flexible. For this, we used Rancher along with Docker Compose. And from it, we gain repeatability, flexibility, scalability, and control. So that's all harking back to those original points that I was uh, making at the beginning of the presentation. And that's all I've got to say for today. Does anyone have any questions?